Stanford University. Welcome to the second uh, edition, of, uh, sec second volume or whatever, of E380 Fall Quarter 2009-2010. Uh, a little bit of administrivia. I seem to have confused some of you about how the class actually works. It's a uh, per lecture assignment, not at the end of the time summarize the whole thing. Per lecture convinces that you paid attention, understood what was going on, and Ten of those, and you get your unit. Um, now that we've gotten through that, it is all web-based. Um, today's speaker, speaker, David Unger, wrote four theses. Uh, probably a mistake. Uh, they're all great ideas, all great implementation, packaged into one thing, and as a result, nobody knew, knew, nobody knew what to do with what he'd done. Um, So today's talk is about how to manage a career and how to manage ideas when you do too much, which is a problem. Uh, many of you will discover that you've got too many good things to put into a thesis, and that's actually a problem. You need to go a little lower. But it is still possible to succeed if you make this mistake, and today's speaker will tell us how. Well, thank you. Thanks. Let me just start by checking we've got sound out of the computer. Uh, yes, we do. Excellent. Okay. Good. We may need, that may need to be a little louder once we get going. So, thank you so much. Uh, okay. So, this talk is a reprise of a talk I gave in Italy. And, and there, I mean... When I was here, I used to teach in Terman mostly, and they kind of had Terman beat over there in terms of architecture, which, which is, you know, Stanford's pretty nice, but wow. So, um, you know, ask your professors to improve the decor if you like that. Uh, how many people here are taking the course for credit, just to get a rough? Okay. Well, thank you. Thank, thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, by the way, uh, this was the occasion of receiving the Dahl uh, Nygaard Award, which was the fourth or fifth year they've given this for career achievement in object-oriented programming technology. Um, for those of you who are young, uh, that's Kristen Nygaard, or Nygaard, as the Danes say, who uh, was one of the inventors of Simula, along with O.J. Dahl, who was one of the inventors of Simuli and I believe structured programming and it was uh, pretty amazing to uh, be uh, given this award so uh, what do you do when you get the award what kind of a talk do you put together this is going to be a talk about the work and some other things as well so this talk is really a bumpy ride because uh, we'll hit the work the principles the principles behind the principles, the personal lessons I learned from the experience. And um, we're going to bounce back and forth. And let me just see if I can adjust the screen resolution, because I see <coughs> we're getting cut off. It's just that. It's OK. okay. Other Thanks, guys. So uh, before we get started, this isn't my work alone, there are a whole lot of folks who contributed a lot and institutions and what you can see on the bottom is you know they ought to get the credit and I can take the blame. Okay, so here we go. The first thing we're going to do is uh, the meta principles and the real fundamental ones. And these apply everywhere, not just to this work. So the first one is I call leading following. Actually, I learned it from Kristen McIntyre, a friend and colleague. And the point is, is that there's an essential order to things. And you know, you have to lock the barn door uh, before you want to keep the horse, not after. And this meta principle applies not only to the principles, but to the other meta principles. 
the, uh, here are two examples of leading following. So uh, Randy coined this about self, but it applies uniformly. This is a, a principle. First, you make things simple, and then all your stuff gets built out of just a small number of concepts, because that's simplicity. That means you have uniformity. And once you have that, then you can mix and match. And that means you have malleability in your system. Now, here is a meta principle that's an example of the leading following. I guess you could call leading following meta meta principle in this case. And that is um, start with your values, what you care about. Those will tell you <laughs> general principles. Oh, she's trying to fix it. Thank you. I can also change the resolution from the Mac if that'll help. Just, just let me know, dear AV uh, helper. And then the principles. <laughs> the principles will give you specific practices. So know what you want to do. That gives you general principles. In other words, the values. And then from there, you get specific practices. So what do I mean by that? Well, for example, if you want to promote creativity, I think I'm going to move a little bit more to the side. One thing you want to do is design a computer system that offloads the cognitive burden. This is a great phrase from the human interface community. And this means things that people normally have to consciously think about, like remembering the name of that command. You instead uh, let them just point somewhere on the screen and click. So now the person is using, say, spatial memory, which is precognitive. Other examples of specific practices are uh, replacing tools with direct manipulation or in programming language design, not requiring type declarations. That always gets the Europeans going a little bit. Okay, next we're going to, I warn you, this is a bumpy ride. We're going to dive in and talk about some particular work I did. Uh, that's a piece of why I got to go to Italy. It's called uh, Generation Scavenging and uh, it was a very efficient garbage collector that used uh, age information about the objects to save a lot of time. And uh, this was uh, one of the very first generational collectors. Okay, so the idea is we'll exploit skewed probabilities. It turns out that most young objects in your heap die young, so we'll only spend time on the live young objects, not the dead young objects, not the old objects. And uh, when I implemented this, the garbage collection time, this was a long time ago, primitive computers was reduced from tens to under a second. And um, of course, this, this is you know, optimizing things by eliminating work. And uh, the other principle is it optimizes what's important. Because this, uh, at the time, made it possible to uh, take a level of indirection out from the mutator. And that meant that your program ran faster, as well as the pauses for garbage collection were uh, shorter. So here's the real story. I am a graduate student at uh, that place, which must not be named, up on the <laughs> other side of the bay. It's OK. We won't kill you. Yeah. I got in so much trouble when I taught here by saying, go bears. And I had students with projects named Beat Cal. Uh, that was the acronym. OK, so I followed the standard implementation for Smalltalk at the time. This is pre-Java for all you uh, youngins out in the audience, right? Java wasn't even a gleam in Gosling's eye, but there was Smalltalk. And now um, the standard implementation is reference counting plus an object table. Peter Deutsch comes back from MIT, and he was uh, a mentor for me at Berkeley. And he says, he whispers in my ear, hey, why don't you treat new objects different from old? Because I think he'd been talking to David Moon, who had been looking at this approach for uh, Lisp implementations. And uh, my advisor was Dave Patterson, who's a fantastic advisor. But he says, don't bother. Just stick with reference counting. That's, you know, that works. That's good enough. But uh, being me, I went and collected traces, got good simulation results, went ahead and implemented it first with indirection, and then uh, with 
uh, direct pointers and one pass. This was the first small talk system, which was basically the, the object-oriented language of the time, without a level of indirection and with 32-bit pointers instead of 16-bit pointers. So you basically learn not to follow your advice as advice? Why? Wait, wait, it's coming. Here's what I learned. Here's what I learned. I learned that even the best, smartest advisor can be wrong. And so the lesson, I think, is, is you respect the authority, but trust your own instincts and judgment. In other words, don't ignore your advisor all the time. Now, once I had this system, I fixed up the cursor so it would change every time we were doing a garbage collection. So it changed for the duration of the collection and changed back. I thought this was really cool because the cursor was in the changed form for a really short time. It's you, like you could barely see it. But, but it annoyed the crap out of the users because they're trying to use a system and the cursor is going whoop, 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 like, you know, just jerking their attention around. So the lesson is, if, if we're doing systems work, we want to do the art that hides art. In other words, your best implementation work should be invisible. <laughs> yeah, yank their attention to the corner of the screen. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay, uh, next piece of work I'm going to cover was small talk on a risk. This was my dissertation work at Berkeley for Dave. And basically, at that time, if you wanted to use small talk, you had to get in the car, drive all the way down here from Berkeley. What a schlep! I actually got to use, got to understand small talk and see it only cause a. A fellow student, Dan Halbert, had Butler Lamson's car when Butler was out of town. And so that's how we had the transportation. Okay, so at that time, uh, to really use small talk and get the nice environment and stuff, you needed this big honking ECL machine that was so noisy it had to sit in the back room with a coax or video cable out to the terminal, which was in the office. And we showed and this is back in the early 80s, mind you, when you know, computers were computers and men were men and all that stuff, that a 330 nanosecond, one single chip micro could beat this huge thing and run small talk. Now, why? Well, there are only two things that really mattered. One was keeping it simple and the other was co compiling. So four byte codes could be executed in one microprocessor cycle. And uh, it's kind of off the bottom here, but <coughs> uh, Dave, in addition to teaching me simplicity, uh, the way I remember him is he talked not as fast as I do, and sometimes he had to search for the words. And I remember as a graduate student in his office just learning to be patient and wait to hear what he had to say because it was always worthwhile. And uh, what you can't quite read on the bottom here is he taught me the difference between glib and wise. Now, over and over again in my career, this came up. I found someone who could teach me something, and then I <coughs> tried to learn what it was. And you know, when I think of the stuff and the award, I, you know, it's like, well, this guy taught me that, and that one taught me that, and this person taught me that. So, I mean, this is like maybe the, the key. Now, the problem with this is it's hard to learn something new because you want to cling to your beliefs. And, and many people, including me, get this insecure feeling when the beliefs are challenged. But the lesson is, and it's a really tough one, is you're not just what you believe. And so uh, the more you can be with that, maybe the easiest it is to actually learn from these people if, if you're lucky enough to find them. Okay, next we're going to uh, hit some videos that Randy Smith did. So, this is one of those people I was just talking about. There's a great story because this moment changed my, the whole rest of my career. And I'll, I'm going to tell you the story. Um, I'm at Xerox. I'm a new professor here. I'm consulting there. And uh, I meet this guy who's really soft-spoken. And he says, come into my office. I want to show you something I've done. 
in small talk. And what it is, I wish I had a picture. It looks like a, a few suns scattered or on the screen and these planets in some arrangement orbiting them. But what it really was, was a load balancing simulation. The suns represented processors, the planets represented jobs, and if a planet saw that there was a processor kind of far away with fewer planets, fewer jobs, it would make the trip over there, simulating the migration time, and then orbit that one for, you know. And I'm looking at this and I say, well, gee, you know, what would happen if we glued a processor to the back of a job? You know, the job will go somewhere, but then a bunch of other jobs will follow, and then it'll go somewhere else. And I thought, <coughs> this could be really crazy. Now, here's the thing. I was expecting he would stop the thing, open up a text editor, Emacs, VI, take your pick, type in some code, hit compile, get some error messages, make some fixes, hit compile, run the thing, get an error, change it again. But here's what he did. He grabbed one of the processors, one of the suns, stuck it on the back of one of the planets, one of the jobs, hit a menu item that said glue, and that was it. And then I got to see my, my cool chaos ensue. Well, I'd never seen anything like this before. This was a whole new way of thinking about computers and programming systems. So was this a good idea or a bad idea? It's a fantastic idea. And that led to self because let's, we're going to make objects as easy to deal with as these things in this thing called the alternate reality kit. Now, before I go on, you have to see a few excerpts from this video Randy made about the alternate reality kit, which was a system he built in Smalltalk to help kids learn physics. And it's from 1986. Okay, here, here comes the video with the sound. The Alternate Reality Kit is an environment for creating interactive animated systems. It's intended to be a world of parts and pieces that the user can modify to assemble their own micro-worlds. So the first thing to notice, believe me, I ought to go find this whole thing. I only have time for tiny snippets. It's not a compiler, it's not a system, it's not an interpreter, it's not an IDE, it's a world. Watch this. The user communicates to objects by pressing buttons. For example, by turning on the law of gravity here, I can start a gravitational attraction going between this moon and the planet. Okay. Objects are real, they look physical, there are buttons. Even messages you send to objects are represented as buttons. Now, let me just pause for a minute and remind you, this is 1986. You know, machines didn't have color, machines didn't have 3D. Mostly it was characters on terminals, and if you did get something that was more than that, it was just flat outlines. Now Randy comes in and he does this thing he puts in bezels so the objects look like they have thickness. He adds drop shadows when they move, which I don't think anyone had done before. You see how when this thing moves there's a shadow? He has a hand instead of an arrow for the cursor and when you grab an object the hand closes. The things have momentum, they move continuously. All this was unheard of back then. Nobody was doing it. But the true interesting thing about ARC was none of these. And so you have to look past this artistry. But this does introduce this one theme, which is artist versus entertainer. There's a ton of artistry in the alternate reality kit. Okay, watch this one. The buttons can be picked up and carried over to other objects. For example, by turning off the law of motion, I stop any motion of the planet and the moon or any objects in the environment. By trying to drop a button onto an object that doesn't understand the message, the button is made to simply fall through. That prevents a certain class of errors. Okay, how many people in this room have ever gotten a type error from the compiler and looked at it and tried to figure out, come on, raise your hands, guys. 
Yeah, yeah. Okay, so this is what errors ought to be, right? If the object doesn't want to understand the message, you drop the button on it and it falls through. Compare that to understanding the, all the papers that have been published in a conference like Uppsala for the past 15 years on type systems. Okay, now you'll know one of the innovations in self was a prototype-based metaphor which involved creating objects without having classes. So watch this from ARC. One of the more useful messages is the Xerox button which is used for making copies. Okay, so there he is. Everyone thinks object-oriented systems mean classes and you instantiate a class and a class is some nebulous thing that's not concrete anyway. He's just, how do you make an object? Eh, you just Xerox it. It's brilliant, but the brilliance doesn't necessarily leap out at you. Okay, speaking of leaping out at you, this is a longer clip, and it's got more than a few interesting ideas in there that are harbingers, and it's going to be a test. Can you spot them? And for all of you who are doing assignments, you know, I will, I'll give the answer, but why don't you see if you can spot them and, and write up how many you did spot and why you did it. By the way, I once used this video as my final exam when I taught the programming languages course here. And that's how I found some of the best students to work with I ever found. Here goes. Let's look at getting inside the law of gravity here so we can modify it. In order to create new buttons, the user uses the message menu button. That button will give you a menu of all the possible buttons understood by the law of gravity. Selecting from the gravity category, subcategory accessing, set G, gives us a button that will set the universal constant of gravity operating within the law of gravity. This is an unusual button because it has a parameter to its message that is a little plug to be dropped on a numerical value for G. Let's go back into here in the warehouse. We can create a number scale and find a slider to attach. On top of the number scale, and that's a handy way to create numerical values. And now this is attached and ready to be pressed. We've changed the value of G inside the gravity law. Now because buttons are themselves physical objects, they respond to other buttons. I happen to have already created the toggle permasend button here. That puts the button into permasend mode which means that the numerical value is continuously relayed into the button and down through into the law of gravity. The use of animation indicates that things are active. The plug is continuously relaying the value here, the button continuously relaying the, the value into the law of gravity. For example, if I drop that out of no man's land, the button stops relaying things because it's not attached to anything. <coughs> okay, got that? No time to show it again, so hope you got it. So, and remember, this is before all the papers that would come later about this stuff in much clunkier contexts. But here it is. First of all, there's what we now call introspection, a kind of reflection in language design. That is, he has a button that looks inside things and tells you what they can do. Okay, and um, that serves uniformity, right? Because even the way you take things apart to look inside of them is done with the same kind of thing. Then he's got state unified with behavior, something we carry over into self. That gravity parameter, even though it's a variable and not an action, is affected the same way as invoking an action. Okay, also, you'll notice he has a warehouse of prototypes. Again, back in the day, there was just a global namespace of classes, and now with Java, it's a strange namespace of classes and import statements you have to wrestle with till you're blue in the face. But he has a warehouse of prototypes instead of a global namespace. Another innovation. Uh, then, uh, in the uh, interface world, 
he has data flow which is made concrete by lines and that permasend button is doing behavior altering reflection because it's changing the behavior of the set G button to run continuously. This is way before folks were talking about reflection. I mean maybe Brian Smith was, was starting to think about it then but before the flurry of papers and everything else. And um, the final <coughs> thing you can't read is animation being used to show computation. Now, uh, this last clip really sums up the essence of what's going on here. So watch it carefully. And in Randy's wonderful way, you don't always get it. So here it is. The implementation of the alternate reality kit continues to evolve, but the fundamental character of the system will remain unchanged. The physical world metaphor, the way in which everything appears as a material entity, including normally intangible objects like a compiler or the law of gravity. This physical manifestation influences the feel of applications that are developed in ARC and will influence the user's experience with these applications. It's hoped that users will come to have a sense of operating in a kind of self-contained reality, a reality that's enough like the everyday world so they know what's going on, but one that has room for any magic the user may wish to include. Ideally, users will come to forget that what they're watching is merely a video image. Thanks for watching. What it says down at the bottom is create a consistent experience. And the point is, is that if our systems are any good, we, you know, they, the user will be absorbed into them. And we're creating reality for the user, not an implementation of something. But, yeah, <laughs> that said vaporize, that's what that was, yeah. This, by the way, for the kids, this is not a, a computer. This is just a video terminal. The computer is this big hulking thing in a closet somewhere. Okay, so that's Randy Smith, my uh, co-designer of the language self and, and partner at Sun. Look to the real world to combine simplicity with power. And uh, the personal lesson, which you can't read at the bottom, is the right partner is everything when you do your work. So the alternate reality kit does actually illustrate some of the principles and meta principles. For example, uh, Randy valued simplicity and it achieves that by having a small number of concepts. That's the, that's the value, that's the principle, and then the practice is everything is an object. It's prototype based, there are no classes. Also, Randy wanted this to be accessible. Remember this was to help children learn physics. So the, pra the principle is you use what your users already know and the practice was mimic the physical world, use direct manipulation. Again, Randy's another one of these folks who uh, speaks softly and if you notice from the video, he doesn't always hit you in the face with the great idea. He lets you see it. So don't confuse glibness with insight. That was a lesson I learned. Also, remember the story about sticking the uh, processor on the job. Well, that was a challenge, right? That was kind of confrontational. That's not very, strictly speaking, Californian. But I'm not a native Californian. Uh, and the lesson for me might be, go ahead and confront respectfully, but then listen and watch and see what you learn. Um, and finally, that suggestion was playful. It wasn't serious. It was kind of a Weisenheimer thing to do. And the lesson is creativity is not a serious activity. You won't innovate if you're being too serious or in too serious an environment. Okay, now we'll talk about the self-language itself, which is another piece of the puzzle of why the heck I got this award. Um, Randy and I, or a lot of folks, when we did object-oriented programming and we drew stuff on the board, we drew pictures like this. There's a dog object and 
he's got an, a, a, P, a thing which uh, says that it's owner and that refers to another object. And, uh, and these were the mental pictures. And the pictures always had names and contents. But, you know, um, class-based languages don't really work that way. The names are off in the class somewhere. But in designing our language, again, because we valued creativity, we wanted to make it effortless to express yourself. And so we wanted to match the language to the mental model. And the broader lesson is when you design your systems, especially if you're designing conceptual systems like languages or mathematical notations. I know we have one mathematician in the room. Hi, Vaughn. Uh, don't just make your systems elegant and powerful, but know why you're making every design choice. You know, see if you can trace that path from a value to a principle to a practice for every design choice. Too many people design languages because, well, I like this feature in Ruby, so I'll put this in, and I like this feature here, so I'll put that in. And pretty soon you have languages, need I name them, that are just a dog's breakfast of features. Uh, this is a video to actually give you a taste of self. This is an excerpt from another one of Randy's videos. He made the best videos. And I love this because it describes self and the coolness just sneaks up on you. I mean, remember, this is an environment for real programming all implemented in itself. So watch and enjoy. Let's look first at the language semantics. This is a self object. A self object is simply a collection of slots. Each slot has a name and a reference to some other object. So this object here might represent a Cartesian point with x and y values referencing numbers. Numbers are first class objects in self. Computation happens in the system through sending messages. I can uh, send the message x, for example, to this object, and that will activate the contents of the x slot. An object simply returns itself when it's activated, unless it's a method object. We have a method object here in the length slot. Let me try to send the message length, and evaluates to this floating point number. What happens when a method is activated is the system makes a copy of it, and installs it in the context of this object. So all the messages are then sent to the message receiver. All these tokens are messages, x and y, of course, square plus and square root. And the square root was returned as the result of the message send. Now, an object can respond to more than the messages that match its own slot names, thanks to inheritance. If a message name doesn't match locally within these slots, the system continues to look up through objects referenced by slots whose name end with an asterisk. These are called parent slots. So here you could see there are methods for doing arithmetic and printing and so on. And in fact, there are further parents farther and farther up in, into the system. A parent is a natural place to store shared state and behavior. For example, the length method might be used by all sorts of points. So let's move it from here into the parent. But we would want each point to have its own private x and y slots. If I make a copy, the routine way to make new objects in self, it will have this parent in common, but its own private x and y slots. This is reminiscent of instances in classes and class-based systems. But in fact, it's quite a bit more flexible than that. Because, for example, I might decide that I don't want x to be uh, a constant 43 in this case, but a method object. So let's change the x slot in this object from returning a constant to actually performing a computation by installing this method. Now the x slot will return the value of y. We've created a point whose x value is constrained to equal the y value. In fact, any object can be inherited from. Now this object inherits from our original point. And if I remove its y value, 
we'll have a point whose x is computed to equal y and whose y is inherited from this object, the value 1. For example, let's send it the message length again. And we get the square root of 2 as an answer. That's because when the length method runs, it asks for x and y, which are now both equal to 1, and returns the square root of the sum of their squares. The uniformity of self-simple and tangible object model gives the system quite a bit of flexibility. Okay, so there you go. You know, can you just kind of drag methods and variables around in whatever programming world you're using today and replace one with the other and all the code still works? I'm, I'm still waiting for that system. I mean, we built it. I'm still waiting for something like that to be mainstream and popular. So you get a lot of reuse because the code doesn't know whether even in the same object things are stored or computed. You get setters and getters for free because of the unification of state and behavior. Um, there was a paper by Ola Lehrman Madsen, who was a student of Christen Neugerts, who worked on a language called Beta with Christen. And they were very proud of the fact that you could override classes. So if in a particular part of your program you wanted the standard string class or set class to be different, that you could override it. And I met him at a conference in the 80s, and I, he explained this to me. He said, well, that just comes for free in self, because things are accessed by sending messages to yourself. You find them up high in the hierarchy, you override them, you get a new prototype. And that led to a great connection where he sent me a marvelous student, um, Ola Eason, who came here as a grad student, and Lars Bach, who you'll learn, hear more about him later. And even Ola Madsen spent a year with us as a visiting scholar. That was great. Beta, by the way, is probably the most underappreciated object-oriented language in the world. Uh, singletons come for free because it's prototype-based. And dynamic inheritance, you know, a parent pointer can be changed just like anything else. Okay, so what did I do for this? Well, um, the way I remember it, and of course memory is, a, is unreliable, um, at lunch Peter Deutsch whispered in my ear that even though Smalltalk had seven kinds of variables and pseudo variables, they could be unified. And I took that idea and uh, also made it into a message send instead of variable access. Uh, because of inheritance. So whether it's a local variable, a receive, an instance variable, a class, we didn't have classes, a global, all unified in self. Um, I came up with the idea, we kept writing the word self all the time since everything was a sent to self or started out that way. So I said, let's just make it understood and not have to write it down. Um, putting the slot names actually in the objects, might have been mine, might have been Randy's too, the name of the language, I had to wear a name tag because I was a consultant. And I got tired of writing my name on it. And so I, I wrote nil, super, true, false. And, and then I just started writing self on the name tag because I thought that's true, that, that works, right? So that, we liked that joke so much we named the language after that. Uh, if we'd waited any longer, the language would have been called name tag, right? So. Then I wrote the first draft of a paper with the language design and gave it a, a bombastic title, The Power of Simplicity. And uh, you'll see Randy left uh, to go to England and, and drop the whole thing. But I took it seriously, um, and more about this, but I was an assistant professor here, needed a research topic. So I said, let's do something with this design. Now, that leads into the implementation work. I uh, had uh, several grad students, two in particular, who worked on the implementation work. First, uh, Craig Chambers and then Urs Hotzle. And these guys were incredible. And at the time, we thought it was impossible to make this language run efficiently because it did all these things that were more abstract than languages of the time. A variable was accessed with a message send. Uh, inheritance could be dynamic. Then slot names were the objects, all of that stuff. So uh, what's really cool is 
when you've got great, great folks, you know, you give them impossible things to do and they do it. And the, the lesson I like to hit hard in an industrial setting is don't waste great people on the merely possible. And for any faculty in my audience, you know, don't, don't let your graduate students tackle any thesis dissertation topic that you know can be done. Just, you know, direct them the things that you don't think are possible. And by the way, that's how you attract the great ones to work with you. The students are probably, the you know, ones who don't have topics now are probably shivering in their boots or something. But it's true, I think. Okay, so um, I did have a vision, and that was that compilers are so, like, old school. Forget it. Uh, they're compromises for bad machines, you know, and now we have modern machines. After all, you know, it's 1986, when, or 87 when we're doing this. And um, to support creativity, the implementation really has to give the user the illusion of reality. Just like Unix makes you think a file is real, and a file is, is not real at all, it's just a bunch of data scattered around your disk. But you don't really know that, and it, it stays there, it feels kind of real. And of course, this follows the principle of offloading the cognitive burden, so we want third of a second turnaround when the user makes a change, the behavior of the system should change instantly. Source, full source level debugging, even if we're doing optimizations. and uh, do an implementation that uh, is good enough that the programmer can factor into tiny little routines without any performance penalty. So it offloads the burden of structuring for performance from the programmer. I was inspired. Uh, I had done uh, that small talk system with generation scavenging I talked about. And I was negatively inspired by that because Peter Deutsch, with the first dynamically translating system, what we now call a JIT, beat the pants off of it performance-wise. And no incremental optimization I could do to the interpreter would come close to the, the deutsch Schiffman system. But I did like the garbage collection algorithm there. And then the SOAR project I've talked about. Now, the key idea behind implementations, I'm convinced, is misdirection. Okay, I would, I'd show you a video of Penn and Teller if I had the time. It's stage magic. You're fooling your poor programmer into thinking that his or her code is running. But it's not, right? It's something else completely. And so as long as it, it, it seems to do what it ought to do, that's, that's what you want. Now, our first generation implementation used generation scavenging. Maps is an idea I had come up with which says even though the slot names seem to be in the objects, we can behind the scenes factor them out into separate objects. Uh, but the user never knows. Uh, customization, that's another idea I came up with. Even though the same thing like X might result in a message send or just a variable access because it's inherited by two different objects, we can compile separate versions of the code behind the scenes and the user will be none the wiser, it'll just run fast. And of course, dynamic compilation. Now Craig came up with a bunch of new compilation techniques uh, which were all ways to take a language without type declarations, do inlining, infer types, do more inlining, infer types, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, we had this problem that the compilation pauses were too long and if you made a small change the performance would get worse because the compiler was using all kinds of funny fixed heuristics for inlining. So Ors comes up with this brilliant idea which is let's be lazy. In other words, we compile quick and dirty the first time you want to run some code and the compiler sticks in counters so it can tell what kinds of objects are actually being used then the system, while it runs, is looking to see where the hotspots are. We didn't have the word hotspots. A marketeer came up with that later when the technology was adapted for Java. But the system monitors that, and then it dynamically takes those things that are running a lot and compiles them again with a slower compiler that can inline away the calls because it knows what kinds of objects are being run from the profile information. And all this without the user ever knowing. 
And this was great. This was a real breakthrough because the, the system ran faster and the pauses went away. I'll show you this on the next slide. But of course, there was a lot of work to implement, but that's what grad students are for anyway. Okay, so uh, very briefly, up at the top is fast compiling and over on that side is fast running. And you can see we kind of followed this path till we got to the end, which was really, really cool. Okay. Now, uh, just some real uh, specific numbers. We had a 28-MIP machine, and when we got lazy, execution time went up by a factor of 1.5. And on the Stanford integer benchmarks, which since I'm at Stanford, they must be really good benchmarks, uh, we were going 50% the speed of optimized C++. And if anyone ever uh, gives you speed numbers without comparing to optimized C or C++, I'd be real skeptical because, you know, this is, was the gold standard at the time and probably still is. I mean, if they're doing numeric computing, maybe optimized Fortran's a gold standard. But, you know, we weren't comparing to some cockamamie straw man. Okay, so um, we got agility. The startup time when the system had to sort of compile the things to run the UI went down to half a minute from a minute and a half. And while interacting, the pauses went under a tenth of a second. That's fantastic. But what about debugging? Remember, we're re-optimizing, we're inlining all behind the user's back, and we, yet we want to support source level debugging. So I had this great idea, which was, if dynamic optimization is good, dynamic de-optimization is also really good. So what we do is, we're going to fool the user some more. Remember, the only time the user can stop things and observe is when an error occurs or you know, for something that's long running at a backward branch or call, which is what you need to insert so that things can't go too long when the user hits the interrupt. It feels like the system is being interrupted right away. That's the best the user can tell. Okay. Um, so what we did was we stuck in enough breadcrumbs in the system so that we could recreate this full source state at every one of those points. And then we can transparently <coughs> switch to unoptimized code. So when the user starts single stepping, it looks like it's, so even though you change something that's been inlined and you're about to call it, you don't get the obsolete version getting called because we switched to unoptimized code. It's not inlined anymore, it calls the latest current version. If you then start running at full speed and it's hot, it'll re-optimize it, yada yada. Oh, uh, just works, right? So again, this is all stage magic. It provides the illusion of fast source level execution. Now, the personal lesson is I knew what I wanted, right? Like I, I told you, I, I had the vision. This thing's going to be an artificial reality like Splash Mountain or something. And I could explain it to my students and later employees, and I turned them loose to do it. So. Maybe that's the personal lesson I learned about um, if you're leading a project. By the way, um, <coughs> I'll mention it later, but this source code became the base for Sun's main Java implementation later on. And uh, later on at Sun, as we were lobbying for them to take notice, we had this poster made up in our hallway back when Java was really slow. And we were saying, hey, look, guys, do you use dynamic optimization. And we had some, some stats here. Java was that fast compared to C++ at the time. And, um, you know, here was, um, you know, here are some things. I'm not sure what these were. This might have been Java uh, simula being simulated under self. We had the world's fastest Java system for a short time by translating it to self. And this was, you know, what we thought maybe we could do. And of course, Scott McNeely liked to talk about kicks butt. So the two extremes were runs like a pig and kicks butt. Little historical fun there. Okay, now back um, before we moved from Stanford to Sun, when I was still teaching at Stanford, I had a couple of great ideas for multiple inheritance and privacy. Remember, Randy was still in England. Later on, he would come back. We would move the project to Sun and finish it there. Um, and so I came up with these rules 
I call them prioritized parents, the sender path tiebreaker rule. They were published in a thankfully obscure journal. The details are so embarrassing, I'm not going to go into them here, and not really enough time. Uh, and Craig, bless his heart, he could make anything work in a few days. Okay, now, why is the word hubris on this slide? Well, it's up there because over the next year or so, we kept having these bugs, which at first we blamed on Craig's compiler, but it turned out it was doing exactly what it was supposed to do. It's just that the effect of these rules was to make a lot of programs completely unpredictable and incomprehensible. I mean, you could work it out with pencil and paper. Oh, yeah, that's why. But you took a long time. So um, the lessons that I've learned from that really have affected me because I really screwed up big time with these rules. So um, the first lesson is don't design things based on examples. We all tend to reach for the example. And examples are good to illustrate. But if you have a new idea or a new feature and it seems really cool, think about it at the level of principle. And, and so I just don't trust. And when I read language papers and they justify some cool feature based on an example, instantly I get very suspicious. And yet most of them do. OK. The next thing is simplicity trumps expressiveness. It's far better to make a system a little too simple so a person has to write extra stuff or even write it twice with a comment that says, look over here, than to have a system that acts in strange ways and nobody can understand why. So simplicity trumps expressiveness. And of course, the main one, I, I wasn't and I'm still not as clever as I thought I was which is an interesting meta regress in there. But we won't go into that. Uh, now, uh, it was probably me. But at the time, remember, I was a Stanford professor or assistant professor. And I kind of think that it, professors have to really watch out for this. Because when, when I was a professor, I spent all my days you know, filling up empty young skulls full of mush with the truth. And after a while, I thought I knew more of the truth than I really knew. So I don't know. Maybe it's an occupational hazard. OK. Uh, one other thing, which I only have time to hit briefly, the interface. At the time, the standard for interactive interfaces was um, small talk. It had browsers. It had inspectors. Everything you saw, if you squinted, was a tool, not an object. And you had to constantly manage your tools. First, I want to look at this thing. Then I want to look at that thing. Then I want to look at that thing. And uh, that's what things are like today, like Eclipse and the, the main programming environments. And following ARC, I thought that was like not the way at all. So I wanted to have objects be real and make our person who's using the system think they are real. So you know, my model was a Disneyland ride where um, you know, the pirates of the Caribbean, they're not real, but it kind of makes you think they are. Or, or you know, you're, you're on Thunder Mountain and it makes you think the track is going to end and you're going to go off the cliff and die. So we want to make our users think they're going to die, but the model is a Disneyland ride, an artificial reality, not a computer system or an implementation. In fact, ask me about my job interview story after the talk. So. Each object was a thing on the screen. And of course, each object would only be in one place on the screen. So if you followed pointers and came back, you could see it because it would like, point back to the guy. And um, the other key thing was to reinforce the reality with cartoon animation techniques. I had um, a young son. We watched cartoons. That's what you do with a young son, right? Nice, violent cartoons. And we'd freeze frame through them because I got fascinated and I started reading books. And here are some of the techniques. So with Bei Wei Chang, who was my grad student here, we built uh, a pretty unique environment, which we later called UI1, because there was later a UI2. Uh, hello? There we go. So I'm going to try to give you a real quick demo. and. Uh, 
This is unstable under Snow Leopard. This is code from 1990-ish and running with 8-bit X because we had to use stupid color map tricks to get the frame rate up on computers. But uh, you'll see that there are all these cartoon animation techniques. So when things move, there are streaks. That's motion blur. Let's, I can show you with this guy. You see there, well, it's hard to see with that guy. But I could, when an um, arrow, if we want to say, show us the object this slot points to, things zoom in, the text faded in the original version, the arrow moves uh, slow, then fast, then slow, the object wiggles a little bit when the arrow hits it. I could show this to you in slow-mo if there's time. Menus don't just appear on the screen, but they zoom in and out. So no pixel changes suddenly. Uh, and there are a lot of animation techniques in here. I really don't have time to go over this in detail. Um, but um, it was cool. And the best Christ you know, what's Christmas vacation for? Well, it's for getting work done, right? So the best Christmas vacation I ever had, I came in, it was either 91 or 92. Maybe it had to be 91. And... Um, I spent every day getting the motion blur right and the wiggles right. And I could only have done it in self because I needed the fast performance and I needed the fast changes. And when I was done, it looked right. And uh, we were the first people to use cartoon animation techniques on a computer screen. Up till then, things either weren't animated or moved very slowly because they didn't realize that if something moved across the screen in a frame, you just had to put a streak or something in there. Like the road, when I talk about this in a whole talk, I have clips of the Roadrunner and it, it gets really clear. Now it's everywhere. This was one of the three papers that won an award between 10 and 24 years after we published it. Uh, Randy later, when he joined the project, did another user interface called Morphic, which has some really cool direct construction principles in it. I don't have time to talk about it. He really needs his own award. Now, let's start the wrap-up by talking about the legacy of this work. So, this is what you guys will care about, since this is academia, right? Uh, we published a bunch of stuff... Uh, there were four Stanford PhD dissertations. Um, three of the papers won awards, like I said, from 10 to 24 years after publication. And uh, they've been a lot of citations. Uh, personally, I did work to keep the system alive. Uh, first, I ported it to Max from Suns, and I ported it to OS X. Then I ported it to the Intel architecture, because this system includes a compiler, assembler, debugger in it. Uh, I replaced the graphics layers as new ones came along. Uh, Adam Spitz, who worked for me at Sun, has done some work to keep it alive, too. I also did a Linux port, by the way. And now Russell Allen, who I have never even met, has done more work on the Linux port and has made a really nice website for this stuff. And... Um, uh, his mail address, which you can't see, is, is mail at russell-allen.com. But I'm, I'm amazed. Um, technically, what did we do with self? Well, we designed this in practical, pure language. We made it practical. We built this object-centric animated environment. Uh, Randy at Sun, uh, his part of the project, built a direct manipulation UI construction environment. Uh, that was also a collaborative programming environment. Another one of my Stanford students, Ola Ayason, built a type inferencer for this thing with dynamic types. So we could take this big heap, 15 megabytes, which was huge at the time, heap of our interlinked objects, and just find the ones and the pieces we needed to do a specific application like diff and make a really tiny thing automatically, inferring types without any declarations. Uh, we tried to explain this to Sun. Uh, the best theory is they just didn't understand what they had with this, so they didn't pursue it. And the project got canceled. Uh, two of the key VM guys went to a startup. They ported our source code to run Java instead of self. 
Sun bought them back several years later for tens of millions of dollars, and that became the heart of Sun's main Java system. Uh, there's nothing quite like self today, though. And that, that saddens me. Now, when I look back, and I've talked about this throughout this talk, it really was about fostering creativity, not just making programming easier. And so we did all these things. There were instant feedback to conserve demands on your memory, not the computer's memory. Uh, we used you know, space on the screen and arrows to offload the cognitive burden. The implementation did inlining under the covers, so you didn't have to worry about performance when you broke your thing up into its separate routines. You lived in a sea of live objects, which let you try things out very easily. Um, and the simplicity of the language uh, made it possible to reuse things that you never thought you could. And of course, that's the values, principles, and practices thing coming in. Um, more influences of this work. Uh, generation scavenging <coughs> uh, spawned a, a lot of descendants, and almost every virtual machine you use has some variation on it in it. And I kind of think that pointer safe languages would never have become practical <coughs> without this work. It, I mean, if I hadn't have done it, someone else would have, but it's really necessary. Um, in the language design, the prototype stuff languished for years. Newton script adopted it. And then Brendan Eich was inspired by it when he did JavaScript. Uh, the implementation, just about every virtual machine, maybe not cell phone ones, uh, they use the dynamic optimization tricks. The cartoon animation techniques you see on your screens every day. And Morphic, that uh, UI that Randy uh, did with John Maloney and others, uh, was ported to other systems as well. But here's the thing. Look at what the people went on to do. So. Randy went on to build this programming environment for Sunspots, which is a sensor net, these little tiny battery-operated things. Uh, worse, uh, you know, taught a bunch of great students at UCSB. And then he went to Google early on, and he apparently was the technical guide behind Google's infrastructure. And it's been said that Google wouldn't be today what it is without Urs's contribution there. Uh, Lars, who came from Denmark and worked on the implementation stuff and the environment, um, when it was one of these guys in the startup who did a Java port and then the lead at Sun for that system. And uh, he's also done a small talk system for embedded devices that runs in very little memory. And these days, he's at Google making JavaScript run fast. Uh, Beiwei Chang, another Stanford uh, PhD along with Urs and Craig, uh, he, I think, was one of the key Gmail designers at Google. And I don't know what exactly he's doing now. Uh, John Maloney, who came to us as a grad, uh, you know, got his PhD at UW, um, took the Morphic system to Squeak. He is probably the key Squeak virtual machine guy. And he's now at, at the Media Lab. Ola Eason, Stanford grad student from Denmark is a key engineer at VMware, and I don't know the details. Uh, Mario Walchko, who uh, came to us from Manchester, worked on implementation and environment at Sun, uh, has stayed at Sun, where he's become instrumental in, in uh, the research side and the Java VM stuff and uh, hardware that might run Java better at Sun. And uh, me, uh, I worked on a dynamic metacircular virtual machine at Sun that let you do effectively fix and continue on the virtual machine itself. And the virtual machine was, of course, written in self for self. Um, and um, uh, now I'm IBM Research working on new programming paradigms to make it easy for like visual basic programmers to program thousand core systems. So uh, the personal lesson here is even if the ideas are great, like the real legacy, the biggest impact is the people. And that's surprising for those of us who fall in love with our ideas. But it seems to be true. Okay. Let's wrap this baby up.
So, I've talked about uh, these meta principles, leading, following, values, principles, and practices, uh, technical uh, principles, uh, you know, uh, creativity, simplicity, design by deletion, hiding your implementation work, don't just make things elegant or, practi or, or powerful, know why, uh, don't design based on examples, simplicity trumps expressiveness. Maybe the non-technical ones are more interesting. Um, respect authority, but trust yourself. Uh, I certainly wasn't as clever as I thought I was, but that probably doesn't apply to anyone else in this room. And because I'm not as clever as I thought I was, you see. Okay, so uh, find out who can teach you. This is a biggie. And then just learn from that person and you know, try to release your own beliefs if that's what it takes to learn. And when you have great people, you know, let them work on impossible tasks. Uh, know what's, you know, don't just pay attention to someone who talks fast like I do, but look for the person who has something worthwhile to say. Uh, if you're going to be creative and innovative, you can't be serious. And then there's one more. And um, this is actually taken uh, from a book. It's an autobiography of one of my favorite musicians, Joe Jackson. And I will read to you some words from his book. See, at the beginning of his career, he was in these bands, and they had this choice. He writes, do we stick to our guns, stay true, and maybe do a couple of gigs a year? Or do we play top 40 hits? You could make a bit of money, you know. And he says... There are two more signs in the horoscope, entertainer and artist. And most people tend towards one or the other. And here's what they are. If you're an entertainer, writes Joe Jackson, you want to make people happy. You want to be accepted. You think your best-selling work must be your best, the one where you got it right, and you feel obligated to give people more of the same. You enjoy applause as an end in itself, and the more applause there is, the better job you feel you've done. The face you present to the world isn't necessarily you. It may well be an act, a routine, or a shtick. You're likely to be a conservative or traditionalist, more likely to take the easier proven route, and you don't want to change the world. You just want to enjoy yourself, make a few quid along the way, and if you can bring enjoyment to others too, well, what could be better than that? But your weak point is paranoia. You might become a superstar, but still lack self-esteem, and that's because your guiding lights, applause, box office receipts, good press, publications, awards in Italy, that, those are my interpolations, they're all outside yourself and ultimately out of your control. Now the opposite of that is the artist, and if you're an artist, you're interested in the pursuit of truth, beauty, and new insights and connections. You want to be an individual rather than run with the pack. You ask questions and don't necessarily accept the answers you get. You may like applause, but it's not an end in itself. You don't necessarily consider your best-selling work to be your best, especially since you're always striving for something better. What you do is not an act, it's you. And you don't want people just to have fun, but to join you in thinking, feeling, and exploring. Your ultimate goal may even be almost religious, not simple pleasure, but transcendence. Now your weak point is self-indulgence. That's a tendency to think that every lame or trivial idea that comes into your head is important just because the muse brought it along with all the good ones. Remember that an artist needs an audience too and a ruthless internal editor to make sure your work is as good, as focused, and as accessible as it can be on its own terms. And Joe goes on to write, Even as an entertainer, I had a knack of making things difficult for myself by trying desperately to do them as brilliantly as possible. Maybe it was the artist in me. So, the lesson here is know which of these you are and then be true to that. 
And me, I think I'm basically an artist. But figure out what you are and then act accordingly. So thank you very much. For more, please visit us at stanford.edu.